Let's start with number four. Okay, I'm going to read this with the, the correct vocab here. The definite integral from negative 2 to 3 um, of x dx. Okay, so um, let's picture this function with a graph. Uh, it's going to be this graph with a slope of 1. We're going to be looking at it from negative 2 to 3. Um, so like I said, this is the definite integral which we can pretty much think of as the area under the curve. Um, and that definitely translates when the function is positive, when it's above the x-axis. When it's below the x-axis, it gets a little funny because then we're talking about negative area, which there isn't negative area. Right? The area is a positive thing. Uh, to talk about negative area, in the real world, which area is defined as something that's it's real, it would be kind of a weird thing. Um, but we, we can definitely conceptualize it, and it can help us to understand the definite integral. Um, and the definite integral has its roots in uh, you know the area question: what's the area under this curve? And then we split it up into a bunch of rectangles, and um, and then we we take those those rectangles and we we split them up into um, well, do, now we uh, break it into what's called a Riemann sum, um, and we say, well, that's a more generalized case. Maybe those rectangles aren't the same width, um, and we allow them to be negative, and, and all these things happen. And um, So we can ha have this picture help us conceptualize what the definite integral is, since it started out as the area under a curve. So the, the good news here is that um, even though the, we might have some negative, quote, area here, the process is still the same as if we were finding the area under the curve um, because this process just splits things up in, you know, these into uh, rectangles uh, without regard to whether they're a positive height or a negative height. Um, so we let n go to infinity um, of b minus a over n times the sum from the first term to the nth term of f of a plus b minus a over n times i. This process is exactly the same, only now sometimes some of the, the, the rectangles will fall below the x-axis, making this value negative, and so some of this area will be negative. And the total number that we come up with will be the total area, including negative. So uh, if I can put this shape over here and show you how it would subtract from this positive area, then the definite integral will wind up being whatever this number is, the area under this section. Um, so the definite integral is just the total area, including if we have some negative area. Uh, so let's do that. We'll take b minus a, that's 3 minus negative 2 over n times the definite integral, or sorry, the, uh, the sum from the first term to the nth term of uh, x. Okay, x is the function, uh, and um, we're, we're going to take the function and plug in this for x. So a is negative 2 plus b minus a, we can see that's going to be 5 over n, times i. Okay, so now we have 5 over n times the sum from 1 to n of negative 2 plus 5 over n i. And now we're going to split these two apart into their own sums, remembering the properties of summation notation. Um, and now we're going to put parentheses because this is going to break up into two sums, but the, the, the two sums together are equivalent to this, and this is getting multiplied by 5 over n. So we're going to make sure that this gets distributed to everything. Uh, so this gets its own little sum, negative 2 plus. We would write the sum from i equals 1 to n of 5 over n times i, but this 5 over n is a constant, so we'll pull that out and leave i there. <clears throat> so this has a formula, it's just a constant. We're going to add up um, 
a bunch of negative 2s. You're going to add up negative 2 a bunch of times. You're going to add it up n times, and that would be just multiplication. That would be negative 2 times n. Plus 5 over n times, this is a formula. It's n times n plus 1 over 2. Remember, we did that little proof of, of, of this sum here. Been taking those dots, copying them, flipping them over, stacking them on top, that whole deal. Um, now this n will cancel with this n, and we can distribute this 5 over n. We'll bring this up here. Um, 5 over n times negative 2 n would be negative 10 n over n, and these n's would cancel. Plus, we get uh, 5 times 5, that would give us 25, times n plus 1, over 2n. And now we want to let n go to infinity uh, of negative 10 plus 25 times n plus 1 over 2n. So this one... N doesn't affect this. As n goes to infinity, this is, stays strong at negative 10. Okay. This one over here, n does affect it. So what's going to happen to it? So we fall back on our our, uh, our recollection of the limits at infinity. As we let uh, n go to infinity uh, for rational functions, we look at the degree of the numerator, degree of the denominator, and uh, in these infinite sums, a lot of times what's going to happen is they're going to be the same. And when the degrees are the same, then we get the ratio of the leading coefficients. So this is 25 halves. We get like terms. We get negative 20 halves plus 25 halves, and we get 5 halves. Let's look at that up here in the, in the, the representation of this picture. Um, first, we'll look at the area of this, this positive area of this white figure. And then we'll look at the negative area of this red figure. Um, so let's kind of give us ourselves um, that little room to work with. Okay, so this guy here, we know it goes from 0 to 3. So this is 3. Um, and back here is negative 2. So this is going to have a base of 3. Noticing this is a triangle. Base of 3, height of 3 since the function is f of x equals x. And so that's going to have an area of 1 half times base times height. Base is 3, height is 3. That's going to be 9 halves. This one here is going to have 1 half times a base of 2 times a height of negative 2. Um, so that's going to give us um, negative 2 as the area. Um, this, we're going to add 9 halves and negative 2, so 9 halves minus 4 halves is 5 halves, just like we already found. So you can see the definite integral doesn't represent the area necessarily if there's negative pieces. Um, what it does represent is the, the sum total of positive and possibly negative areas. Uh, so, and we use that term negative area, um, kind of, I don't know, I, I don't know if I'd say jokingly, but we don't really have negative areas, but they're certainly easy to imagine what they would be, what they would look like, and how they would behave if there were such a thing as negative areas. Okay, so this is the same process. Um, here you can imagine the graph of the function is the parabola. It's uh, no, no part of this parabola would go below the x-axis. It would just be a, a, a steep parabola um, whose vertex goes through the origin and all of the pieces are above the x-axis. So the area under the curve from 1 to 3 would be the same as the definite integral from 1 to 3 because it's all positive. So um, let's get to work. We'll do b minus a. That's 3 minus 1 over n times the sum, i equals 1 to n, of 3 times x. Now x is going to be a plus b minus a over n times i, right? So a is 1 plus b minus a over n, we can see is going to be 2 over n, and that's going to be squared. So 3x squared, and this should have an i there, b minus a over n times i. So we have 2 over n times, um, well, 
look, we can uh, bring this uh, outside of the sum. Okay, so that can actually come out here with 2 over n. So we get 6 over n. Um, and now we're going to want to break this up into individual sums. But we can't do that until we multiply this out. Because this isn't a sum yet, this is a product, a product of this times itself. So we'll do that this times itself. So we get 1 plus 4 over n i plus 4 over n squared i squared. All right. So now each of these is going to get broken out into its own sum. Whoa, that was a bit too much. There we go. i equals 1 to n of 1 plus... Now we would write down the sum from i equals 1 to n of 4 over n i, but 4 over n is a constant, so we'll take out 4 over n. We'll leave i inside there. We'll pull out 4 over n squared of i squared. So now we have 6 over n times the formula for this guy would be we're adding up n ones. That'd be the same as 1 times n. Plus the, uh, the formula for this guy would be n times n plus 1 over 2, and we're going to multiply that by 4 over n. Uh, here we get a canceling of the, the ends and of these factors of 2. Uh, and then we have 4 over n squared times n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 over 6. 6 cancels with 4. This is 2. This is 3. This n cancels with this n. Okay. Now we'll distribute. We get 6 over n times n. So 6n over n plus... Uh, 6 times 2, that's 12, times n plus 1 over n times 1, so n, plus 6 times 2, that's going to give us 12, uh, 6 times 2 times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 over n times n times 3, so 3n squared. Okay. So this whole time we knew what we were going to do was take the limit as n goes to infinity. All right. So what's going to happen to this guy? Well, we can see the n's just cancel, so this would just be 6. Here we can see if we were to distribute the 12 in here, we get 12n plus 12, and so we would have degree 1, degree 1, and the ratio of the leading coefficients would be 12 to 1. So this would just be 12. This one, we, we can kind of do the shorthand uh, as well. We can definitely do it shorthand as well. Um, first, we'll see, are the degrees going to be the same? If I were to multiply this out, would I have degree 2 and degree 2? This is obviously degree 2. Well, we get 2n times n, and that's it, right? There's no more factors to multiply together. you got two factors, two linear factors. Multiplied together is going to give you n squared. So we're going to have 2n squared. That's going to be the leading coefficient for that piece. Then we're going to take that 2n squared and multiply it by 12. So we're going to get 24 uh, over... Actually, let's cancel this a little bit. This will be... Uh, what? I'm blanking here. 4. Uh, so we get 2n squared times 4, and so we would have 8n squared, and all that other stuff. Remember, n's going to infinity, so it just becomes less and less important. So we'd have the 4n squared uh, over n squared, so we, or sorry, 8n squared over n squared, so a total of just 8. And this would be 26. And this 26 is the area under the curve between 1 and 3 because... The, the function is always positive. It doesn't dip below the x-axis anywhere on that interval. Uh, so there we go. There's number six. Number ten. I'm just going to write this down, and then I will explain uh, again. I, I explained... Um, before in class what this means, but of course I'll explain it again, just so that we get it. That's supposed to be a C sub I. Um, okay, 
So let's understand what's going on here. What is what is this? Um, well, it's it's part of a sum, right? So it's a, a sum of a bunch of things, of these things. This part would describe the height of a rectangle, and this would be the width. Okay. Um, and you know why? Why does it look so complicated? Why don't we just label it like we did in the last section? This is for a Riemann sum. Okay. Instead of using x sub i, which we define as like the right side of a rectangle, c sub i is for a function that we break up into rectangles. Let's let this be the ith rectangle. And we don't have to let the right side control the height of the rectangle. We could let any uh, piece of the rectangle control the height of the rectangle. So we'll let this part right here, just anywhere inside this rectangle or anywhere on this sub-interval. Um, so this is the ith rectangle. And we're going to let c sub i c sub i could be anywhere. It could be this one. We could lower the, little, the rectangle a little bit and, and let c be this this uh, value here, and that would define the height of the function, or of the rectangle. Um, because as these rectangles get really small, as we let the an infinite number of them be uh, um, shoved in here, in between a and b, well, it won't matter which our choice of c i is. c sub i, we're going to have kind of at least you can think of it this way, like a limited number of, of uh, you know, I guess a smaller number of choices of C sub i, uh, or rather, more, more accurately, it's, C sub i is going to be closer to both the left and the right side of the rectangle. There's just not going to be a lot of room in there. Okay? So, C sub i is just something on that subinterval. So, you take this value somewhere between the left and the right side of this subinterval, and you take a 6 times that times 4 minus that c value uh, squared. And so the function here that is, well, it's not this function. The function for this uh, example is would, would just be 6x times 4 minus x squared. Um, so that would define the height. So we're talking about this function, 6x times 4 minus c sub i, or not c sub i, x, 4 minus x, squared. Okay, so that's going to define the, the height of a rectangle at, at some x, right? We're going to, we're going to find the, the uh, definite integral of this function. Um, now, delta, set, x, delta x sub i, well, that's just the width of this ith rectangle. Okay, so for any rectangle, we're going to choose some arbitrary c sub i. We're going to choose, or, you know, the, the definition of the subinterval will define how wide this rectangle is, so it'll give us delta x sub i. Um, but again, as um, these rectangles get very, very skinny, um, this delta x sub i is just going to be like this tiny, tiny width, and and actually all the widths of all these rectangles are going to be uh, almost the same. They're going to be very close to each other. They're going to be all approaching zero. They're all going to be this infinitely, infinitely uh, tiny, tiny width. And to express that, we say dx. When we write dx, we mean not only is it a change in x, it's this infinitesimally small change in x. Um, so, like, this expresses, uh, in, a, in a way, the height of a rectangle, the width of a rectangle. Um, but we're going to say that any choice of c sub i is arbitrary. It's just going to, it's not going to matter. Uh, your delta x, since it's so small, we'll just call it dx. It's not, we're not really going to have to kind of define separate delta x's. Because um, what's happening is this thing, this thing, called the norm of delta is going to go to zero. So let me describe to you what the, the norm of delta is. Let's say that I've split up the subinterval this way. Here's a rectangle, and here's another one, and here is another one. Uh, maybe it's going up that high. You can see this one is the widest, has the largest delta x. So since it's the widest, 
we call it the norm of delta. Now, what's what's delta? Delta is the name for this particular way we have split up this uh, this interval from A to B. We split it up into a rectangle that's this width and this width and this width. And there's some rule for deciding how wide um, and, and you know a particular rectangle is. Um, the widest one is called the norm, and the rule would dictate the rule of the the width of this rectangle would dictate that this is the widest one. So as the widest one, the the width of the widest rectangle goes to zero. If it's the widest, then all the other ones must also be going to zero. So as we let the norm of delta, the norm of this partition, um, go to zero, all the other rectangles are going to zero, and so this will be what's called the definite integral from A to B, and so now we know that from the rest of the information it goes from zero to four, A is zero and B is four. So this is defined as the definite integral from 0 to 4 of this function um, times dx, where this, this defines the height of a rectangle, this defines the width of a rectangle, you know, in essence. Um, really abstract, really out there, I, I know. Uh, it's, it's hard to understand, it's hard to explain. Um, but... If you gain any any new uh, bit of knowledge from that, a, a little bit of understanding, then then great. Um, but basically, what we're saying is that no matter how you split this up uh, into rectangles, as you get an infinite number of rectangles shoved into this subinterval, it's gonna it's gonna you know, be the area under that curve. Um, and then we define this. We use this notation. Um, <clears throat> to express that same thing. If I want you to do this, I just write this down. I say the, the definite integral from 0 to 4 of this function, dx. dx is just kind of a way of letting you know that, that x is, in fact, the independent variable. Um, and it also kind of represents the width of a rectangle. So, um, yeah, and all we were supposed to do is, is translate this into this. <laughs> So that we know that when we're doing this, we're when this is written down, we're actually going to do this, and then we're actually going to simplify this. Uh, we we did that for a couple of problems here, right? We found the definite integral. We just used the same process we did from the last section because it's simple and it works, and it works every time, and uh, and it's just not as complicated as as this here. All right. Um. Yeah, next, we'll do sixteen. Um, these ones say to set up the definite integral that yields, yields the area of the region, but you don't have to evaluate it. So we're just going to write down the definite integral, right? So for the definite integral, for every definite integral, we need to know a, b, and f of x. And then dx is just the same every time. It's just dx. Um, so what's a? Let's look at 16. It's this parabola. Uh, and we can see this shaded uh, pinkish region starts at 0. It goes to 4, and the function is x squared. That's it. That is the definite integral that we don't even have to evaluate uh, that is going to find the area under that region. Let's do 18. Uh, well, we are going to find the area of this pinkish region. This pinkish region stretches from negative 1 to 1. The function is 1 over x squared plus 1. And dx will give us, will tell us like the, the width of a, of a rectangle. Alright. Um, now 25. So we're going to sketch the region that is uh, being referenced here in this definite integral and and then use a, a geometric figure like a circle or a triangle or a rectangle or whatever to find the area 
uh, under the rectangle, which will be or the area under the curve, which will be the definite integral. So we actually did this on the on the very first problem we did in this video. Uh, this function is f of x equals x. It's this line that has a slope of one and goes to the origin. Um, we're going to go from zero to four, and so the area under this guy here will be the same as the definite integral because it's all positive. So what's the area of this rectangle? Well, it's going to be 1 half base times height. The base is 4. The height is 4 since f of x equals x and x is 4, so, so y is 4. So we get an area of 8, so a definite integral of 8. Um, do 27 as well. So the definite integral from 0 to 2 of 2x plus 5 dx. Um, now this guy's going to be kind of interesting. Um, it'll be a line that has a slope of 2, so a little steeper than this, uh, and a y-intercept of 5. So this is 5 and has a slope of 2. Okay, that kind of shows us where we're at. Um, and we're going from 0 to 2. Okay. So this guy, if this is a slope of 2, we'll go up 2 and over 1, so that'll put us up at 7. And then up 2 and over 1 again, that'll put us up at 9. And this is 1 and this is 2. So we could do a couple of things. We could split this up into two shapes. Uh, one shape we can see is a rectangle down here. And another one on top of that is this triangle. So this triangle is going to have an uh, area of 1 half times base. The base is 2. The height is going to be the height between 5 and 4, or 5 and 9, so that's going to be 4. So that'll be an area of 4. And then we have this area down here is the area of this rectangle. It's going to have an area of base times height. The base is 2. The height is 5. So that's 10. And when we add those both together, we get an area of 14. So this should be 14. Okay. Another way we could do it is we could say, let's look at the entire shape. This shape happens to be, if we lay it on its side, we can see it more clearly, a trapezoid. Okay. Where this side is 5, and this is 9, and this is 2. The area of a trapezoid is 1 half times the height times base 1 plus base 2. This would be like base 1, and this would be base 2. Okay, so base 1 plus base 2 uh, would be 9 plus 5. And so we'd have 1 half times 2, which is just 1, so 9 plus 5 is 14. And that's the area of this trapezoid, which is the area under the curve here, which is 14. So the definite integral from 0 to 2 of 2x plus 5 dx is 14. All right, um, number 36. Um, so for 36, we're going to start with some prior knowledge they're giving us. So the definite integral from 2 to 4 of x squared dx is 60. The definite integral from 2 to 4 of x dx is uh, 6. And they're telling us that the definite integral from 2 to 4 of dx is equal to 2. So what they want us to do for 36 is to find the definite integral from 2 to 4 of 15 dx. And what they're doing is testing our ability to apply properties of definite integrals. Uh, one of them is, just as a reminder, the definite integral from a to b of, well, if the definite integral from um, a to b of f of x is equal to L, then the definite integral from A to B of 
say k, a constant, times f of x is equal to k times l, whatever that definite integral is. Or another way to look at it is if this 15 can come outside of the definite integral. And so 15 times the definite integral from 2 to 4 of dx is the same as this. And the definite integral from 2 to 4 of dx is 2. And so here we have 15 times 2, which is 30. Um, okay, And uh, 37 is going to be a similar situation. They want us to find the definite integral from 2 to 4 of x minus 8 dx. Um, another property is the uh, definite integral from a to b of f of x plus g of x dx is the same as the definite integral from a to b of f of x dx plus the definite integral of a to b of g of x dx. So it's saying if you're adding together two functions, you can split them apart uh, and take their integrals separately. So this one, uh, this first one can be written as the definite integral from 2 to 4 of x dx. Mm, then we can do minus the definite integral from 2 to 4 of 8 dx, but then that 8, just like this 15, can be pulled outside. And then we could put dx. And so what we have here is the definite integral from 2 to 4 of x dx is 60. No, no, sorry, this is 6. Uh, minus the definite integral from uh, 2 to 4 dx, which is 2. And multiply that by 8, so we're going to subtract 16. So this is negative 10. Um, so that was 37. Let's go on to 42. Um, first, they're going to give us some, some information again to start with. The definite integral from 0 to 3 of f of x dx uh, is 4. And the definite integral from 3, so this one starts where this one ended, to 6, of f of x dx is equal to negative 1. So we could draw a picture of this over to the side, or at least something that fits this description. It may not be exactly what uh, this function looks like, but it definitely will uh, help us picture it. For, so from 0 to 3, this has a definite integral of 4. So this could even like start below the x-axis and then come up like this. And But you know, by the time we get to 3, once we've added up all of this positive with this negative, it's going to total a positive 4. Okay. Even with taking this little piece off of here, we're going to wind up with 4. Then we keep going, and the definite integral uh, from uh, 3 to 6 is going to be negative 1. So we'll come down here and uh, you know go to, go to 6. And so now, the positive put together with the negative on this interval is going to total to negative 1. Okay, so um, we can see this part is represented by this interval, this part is re represented by the, the picture of this interval, and so for 42 what they want us to do is uh, find a few things. Uh, part A they want you to find the definite integral from 0 to 6 of f of x dx. Um, so let's think about that. From 0 to 6. From here to 3, and then from 3 to 6, the whole thing. Um, well, if this 
is a total of 4, like a 4 area, and this is a total of negative 1, then the total is going to be just those two put together. So this would be 3. Okay, And that's just that property that um, if you go from A to C uh, of f of x dx, and you add on from C to B, Well, you can think of this as like the area from A to C. This is A, this is C. And then the area from C to B uh, is just going to be the total area. So it's the same as just adding up all the area from A all the way to B. Uh, so, you know, no need for it to be very complicated. Uh, if from 0 to 3 is 4, and then starting from 3 uh, to going all the way to 6 is negative 1, then the total should be 3. Um, for part b, the definite integral from um, 6, so we're starting at 6 and then going to 3, that's kind of a funny thing to do. Remember what the definition of this is. Okay, so uh, I'll, I'll quickly write down that uh, it's going to be uh, b minus a over n times uh, the um, the the sum from i equals one to n of f of uh, let's see uh, that would be b uh, plus b minus a over n uh, yeah I guess it wouldn't I guess we sh we should really we should start in a um, so what happens if your b is smaller than your a? Uh, well, then 3 minus 6 is going to be negative 3, where normally it's a positive number. So this is going to be a negative number. Uh, it's a negative. Um, so is it having that negative there? What's that going to do to all of your... You know, the area of all your rectangles is going to make them all negative. Uh, it's going to... The, the positive areas are going to be negative, the negative areas are going to be positive, and so it's going to switch everything around. Like, we're going to, if we go from B to A, or from 6 to 3, we're going to count these as positive because all the widths are going to be negative widths. And then uh, from, from here to there, all of these widths uh, are going to be negative, and, but the, the heights are going to be positive, so all these areas are going to be counted as negative. So this negative area will now will be kind of positive area, this area will be counted as a negative area, so this will reverse everything, and what did add up to a negative one will add up to a positive one. Uh, so, hopefully that helps you to picture why when we switch the, the limits of integration, which is what we call these, uh, it switches the, the value of the width, and so we get all these uh, opposite uh, areas, and so we get the opposite of the total. For part C, they want us to find the definite integral from 3 to 3. Well, that's 3 is right here. Well, if we want to find the definite integral, we can think of it as the area. What would be the area under the curve at a single point? There is nothing. There is no area. There is no in-between. Uh, there is no width of a line, so there is no area. So if you don't go anywhere, you can't find any area. Uh, if, you're, if your rectangle has a width of 0, your width times height is going to be 0. Um, and part D, the definite integral from 3 to 6 of negative 5 times f of x dx, just kind of the same as 36 and 37, where there's this property that says I can take the constant multiple outside of the definite integral. So negative 5 times the definite integral from 3 to 6, and we know that's negative 1, so negative 1. So negative 5 times negative 1 is positive 5. All right. Let's slide over here. Go back up, and we will 
uh, start with, well, actually, this will be the last one, so we'll end with 48. All right, here's 48. Um, I paused it so I could draw this whole thing out for you and not have you watch that. Um, so what we're looking at here is just this figure, and they want us to find these definite integrals. So what they're trying to do for you here is if it hasn't taken root yet, they're trying to make this indelible connection between the definite integral and the figure, the, the graph of the function, the connection between the definite integral and the area under the curve um, on each of these intervals. Um, so if you can make that connection between the definite integral and the, the, the cumulative sum of the, the areas uh, of the uh, the areas under this curve, including if we can think of uh, negative areas. Um, so if you can make that connection, if you, the, the connection between the definite integral and the area under the curve, including negative areas, uh, then this, this exercise will have accomplished its goal. So let's make this exercise happy and, and do just that. So um, I believe it's, I've written this down right, yeah. So uh, first let's use the property of of definite integrals and to say we can bring this negative outside. Uh, so we'll put negative the, the negative of this integral, this definite integral from 0 to 1 of f of x dx. So we just need the, the definite integral uh, from 0 to 1. So that would be the area under the curve between 0 and 1. Um, and that, of course, since this guy is below the x-axis and the rectangles that we would use would be of a negative height, we would have a negative area. So between 0 and 1, the area would be uh, 1 half base times height. Base of 1, height of negative 1, 1 half of that, negative 1 half. Um, so maybe before we go through all of these, we should just go ahead divide this into some sub subintervals and, and put the areas there. So, so we'll do this, we'll make a triangle here, we'll make a rectangle here, get another triangle, we'll go down here as negative, we'll make this a, a triangle, and uh, this last guy is also a triangle. So the area under this curve here, and therefore the definite integral from uh, 1 to 3 would be uh, 1 half base times height. So base of 2, height of 2, 1 half of 2 times 2, that would be 2. This also would be a base of 1, this would be height of 2, so it would also have a, a, an area of 2, a definite integral of 2. Um, so this guy here, also going to have an area of 2, this is going to have an area of negative 2, this one negative 2, and this one over here, it's a triangle, 1 half base times height, would give us a total area of 1 half. Um, so here we have, this would be the definite integral from 0 to 1, and this guy here would be the definite integral from, this is just shorthand of course, because you can't have this notation without a function, but um, we, can, we can let it slide. So this would be the definite integral, for, integral from 1 to 3, right here would be the definite integral from 3 to 4 from 4 to sorry 4 to 6 definite integral from 4 to 6 um, this one would be from 6 to 8 from 8 to 10 and this last guy here would be from 10 to 11 so this is helpful. If we want to uh, find these definite integrals, it's definitely going to be helpful to know the area on, on each of these shapes. Uh, so now we have the definite integral from 0 to 1 is negative 1 half. So negative negative 1 half would be 1 half. Uh, here we're going to take this 3 out. Okay. 
Um, the definite integral from 3 to 4, let's see, we got 3 to 4 is already marked off for us. That definite integral we have found, the area is 2, so we have 3 times 2, and that's 6. 3 times this would be 2, that'd give us 6. From 0 to 7, okay. 0 to 7, well that kind of is in the middle of this subinterval, so let's, let's go from uh, 0 to 6, okay, that part's going to be easy. Um, that's going to be uh, negative one half plus uh, two plus another two plus another two. Okay, and now that gets up to up to six, and then up to eight or sorry seven uh, is just this much. So that's a base of one height of negative one. So this is going to have an area of negative one half. So then we'll take away the one half. So 2 plus 2 plus 2, that is 6, minus 1 half, minus 1 half, that gives us 5. Okay, all the way over here to D, from 5 to 11, from 5, okay, so this is 5, um, so we're going to want to kind of deal with that in a second. Let's just start over here, we'll start with uh, from 6 all the way out to 11, so we have negative 2, uh, minus 2, minus 2 there, plus a half, okay, um, so that's from 6 um, all the way up to 11. This is from 6 to 8, 8 to 10, 10 to 11. And now, how about from 5, so that'd be 5 right here, 5 to 6. That's going to have an area we can see of 1 half. Base of 1, height of 1, 1 half base times height would give us 1 half. So 1 half uh, minus 2 minus 2 plus a half would give us negative 4. From 0 to 11, the whole thing, the whole thing. So negative 1 half, that's that first piece, plus 2, plus 2, plus 2, minus 2, minus 2, plus a half. Right, so we have, uh, let's see, 2 minus 2, 2 minus 2, negative a half plus a half, we're just left with 2. And now from 4 to 10. The definite integral from 4 to 6, and then from 6 to 8, and then from 8 to 10. That'll help us to, to figure this out. So from 4 to 6 is 2. From 6 to 8 is negative 2. And from 8 to 10 is negative 2. So negative 2 in all. Uh, and again, the, the purpose here is to help make that connection between the definite integral and the sum of these areas here these positive areas, and these, quote, negative areas. And the definite integral on any sub, the definite integral on any subinterval is just going to be the sum of those areas, positive and negative. Okay, so uh, I hope that was helpful. Thanks for watching. I uh, appreciate it.